emission spectrum of hydrogen. In previous videos, we've talked about how emission spectra arise. In this video, we're going to do a deep dive on the emission spectrum of hydrogen, and we're going to talk about exactly how we get from the energy levels of hydrogen to the emission spectrum that we expect to see. We're also going to think about exactly what kind of information we can deduce from the form of the emission spectrum. So hydrogen has a unique set of energy levels. You can see those drawn on the right here. You can see we go from our lowest energy, energy level n equals 1, to our second lowest, n equals 2, n equals 3, and we go all the way up to n equals infinity. That's our last energy level that very much represents the edge of the atom. We also have the energy of these energy levels written to the right of them. That is because hydrogen energy levels have specific energies. Um, you'll see here they're written as negative numbers. This is because we think of the energy of electrons in an atom as an energy debt. That's energy that would need to be supplied to those electrons to free them from the atom. That's why our very last, e our very last energy level is written as zero electron volts. That's kind of where our baseline is for the energy of, an ele of a free electron. And these energies are given in electron volts. That's because these are convenient units for dealing with energies on these kind of scale. As we've said before, emission spectra are created when excited electrons move from higher energy levels to lower energy levels, like the transitions shown in all these different colours here, and in doing so, they release photons of energy. Those photons have specific energies according to the size of the different transitions, and if we can collect the photons associated with every possible transition from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, that makes up our entire emission spectrum. Now, as we've said, there are an infinite number of energy levels, so if we're going to try and consider every single transition possible, that's going to take a very long time. For As a starter point, we're just going to consider transitions that go from higher energy energy levels and go down to n equals 1, the lowest energy energy level. So we're going to consider only transitions that end at n equals 1. And you can see these are shown in blue is the n equals 2 to n equals 1 transition, in red is the 3 to 1, in purple is the 4 to 1, in green is the 5 to 1, and obviously there are lots of transitions that exist between our 5 to 1 transition and our infinity to 1 transition because these energy levels get very, very close together, so we haven't drawn those just because it would be too messy a picture. Now the best starting place is the lowest energy transition, so that's n equals 2 to n equals 1. At the bottom here is where we're going to create our emission spectrum. So an electron moving from n equals 2 to n equals 1 is going to release a photon with a specific out amount of energy equal to the size of this transition. That's going to produce a line in our emission spectrum at some energy. And we'll label that as the 2 to 1 transition. Now next we'll consider the red transition from 3 to 1. We can see that this transition is going to have a greater energy change associated with it than the 2 to 1 transition shown in blue. We can see that just by the fact the red arrow is longer. We're going from a higher energy energy level down to 1 as compared with this blue arrow here. That means that this transition is going to produce a photon that's going to be higher energy, so further to the right, than our blue 2 to 1 transition. And we'll put that on here. So that's our 3 to 1 transition. So we've done 2 to 1, we've done 3 to 1, now we'll consider 4 to 1, that's this transition shown in purple here. That's going to be higher energy still, but the difference in energy between the 2 to 1 and the 3 to 1 transition is going to be more than the 3 to 1 and the 4 to 1, because the difference in energy between n equals 2 and n equals 3 is larger than the difference in energy between n equals 3 and n equals 4. So we're going to get a photon being released by this purple transition. It's going to be higher in energy still, but not as far higher as the difference between our 2 to 1 and our 3 to 1. So it's going to be a bit closer, but still higher in energy. And we can label that as our 4 to 1 transition. We can say something similar about our 5 to 1 transition shown in green here. That's going to be higher energy again. However, not by as much as the previous change in transition. That's our 5 to 1. And what we'll find is this pattern is going to continue. We're going to keep getting transitions that are higher in energy, but they're going to get closer and closer together. 
What that means, and I'm just going to draw all of these transitions in black, is these lines get so close together that essentially they just start to pile up on top of each other. And instead of getting what looks like a bright line, as we have before, we get almost a bright band where all of these different transitions, all of these photons are being released and they just seem to sort of stack up on top of each other. We can't see the gap in between them, even though they do have specific energies. And this is going to continue until we get to our infinity to one transition, because that's going to be the highest energy transition as it connotes to an electron moving from the very edge of the atom right down to the lowest energy level. So that's going to make up the end of this band. That is our infinity to one transition. So this collection of photons, this collection of lines getting closer and closer together, eventually kind of agglomerating into this band because they're so close together and then suddenly stopping, we call this a convergent series. It's convergent because the lines converge at some value. That's our theta to one transition. And we call this collection of lines a series. So this is a convergent series. And also bear in mind, the colors here are really just so that we can keep track of what transition we're looking at for which line. It doesn't have anything to do with the color of the photons. So this series contains all transitions that go from higher energy orbitals down to n equals one. However, as we said, an emission spectrum is made up of all possible transitions. So not just transitions that go down to n equals one, as are now shown in blue, I've just put all of those transitions we just saw into blue. It means all of the transitions that go down to two, and all of the transitions that go down to three, and all of the transitions that go down to four, and so on, and so on. What this means is that the spectrum looks more complicated than we just showed. So just recreating what we decided on the last page, I'm now going to draw all of the lines we just created from transitions going down to n equals one, but in blue. And we said we're getting lines that are progressively closer together eventually stacking up on top of each other, forming a band, and then suddenly stopping at some value. And these are our transitions that go from some energy level down to n equals one. But we also need to consider these transitions in green that go down to n equals two. And what you can see is that the sort of the kind of pattern we get here where we just have transitions of progressively smaller and smaller energies is very similar to the pattern we see in these blue arrows the only difference is all of these transitions are a lot lower in energy they're a lot smaller the arrows are a lot shorter than all of these transitions so what that means is we get the same kind of convergent pattern the same kind of convergent series occurring for transitions that go down to n equals 2 however these all happen at some lower energy what this means is that we get the same kind of pattern where our lines get closer and closer together, only this series happens at lower energy. And these transitions are going from higher energy and orbitals, higher energy levels, to n equals 2. We get another convergent series occurring but lower in energy than the previous. And we find the exact same thing seems to happen for our transitions that go down to n equals three. We get the same kind of convergent pattern, but again at lower energies still. And these transitions are from some higher energy orbital down to n equals three. And what we find is that these transitions down to n equals 1, these all occur in the UV region of the electromagnetic spectrum. These transitions that go down to n equals 2, they all occur in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And these transitions that go down to n equals 3, they occur in the IR region of the spectrum. And this pattern just keeps going. So for our transitions down to n equals 4, we'd expect the same kind of convergent series happening at lower energies still. Now what can we deduce from the shape, the structure of the hydrogen emission spectrum? Well, first things first, the fact that the hydrogen emission spectrum exists as discrete lines, the fact that it's a discrete spectrum with specific 
wavelengths and energies of photons that are arriving at the detector means that we must be looking at an atom that has discrete energy levels. We must be looking at electrons only being allowed in specific energy levels because that's the only way that we can only be allowed to release specific energies of photons as we transfer between those energy levels. Then we consider the fact that the emission lines keep converging at high energies, high frequencies or low wavelengths depending on how you want to look at it. What that means is that the energy levels making the production of these photons possible must themselves be converging at high energies. So we've discussed how exactly we get the hydrogen emission spectra, and this is the simplest example because it's the simplest atom, it only has one electron. It turns out, however, that all atoms have a unique set of energy levels because they all have different nuclei and they all have different numbers of electrons. What that means is that the transitions between energy levels are different depending on what element you're looking at. That means that the collection of photons that are released as the emission spectrum are also different. And the unique nature of these different spectra means they can be used as a kind of fingerprint for different elements. So if you want to figure out what kind of elements are present in a sample, all you need to do is heat that sample up, maybe even burn it, and look at the light that comes out. And if you can separate the light into a spectrum so you can see the individual wavelengths that make up that light, you'll be able to match them to a known spectrum. This is useful in the lab for elemental analysis when you want to tell exactly what elements are in a sample, but it's also useful in astronomy when we can't actually take a sample of something like a distant star to then measure in the lab. All we have is the light that is arriving at Earth from that star. And if we can see exactly what wavelengths make up that light, we can see what elements must be inside that star. So just summing up, we showed that from the energy levels, it makes sense that our hydrogen spectrum consists of a number of convergent series. And all of these series converge at high energies, high frequencies, and therefore low wavelengths. We discussed how we could deduce from the discrete nature of the emission spectra that we must have discrete energy levels in our atoms. And we saw that because these spectra seem to converge, that means that our energy levels must themselves converge at high energies. Finally, we highlighted that since the emission spectra for each element is going to be different as a result of a unique energy level structure, we can use the emission spectra as almost like a fingerprint to identify elements present in an unknown sample.